I want you to give over um, sometime during this class. I want you, Tyler, to give over what uh, a tarot uh, moment. Okay, a little bit later. Yeah, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you brought your cards. Tyler's one of my students who learned with me in my one of my more recent beginning astrology classes. So it's so great that you're here. I'll have to show. Aquarian minion, yes. <laughs> I'm trying. Hi, Abigail and Shoshana. Hi, Abigail and Shoshana. I can't see anything right now except for what Zoom is telling me to do to live stream this. So I literally have no idea what's going on until I get back to you visually in one second. Okay. And you're going to be away for tonight and tomorrow, right? That's correct. Visiting going... other. Where are you going? No, Just... I'm. I'm, I have to get my grandkids in like two hours. Uh, okay, all right. Um, yeah, it's a whole Megillah that I don't even want to go into at this moment, but yes. And I will not be on Zoom, nor will I be around electronics, so everyone has to fend for themselves. Okay. Kodesh um, Elul, and today is 8-21-2020, Baruch Hashem. Yesterday was the first day of Rosh Chodesh Elul, and today is the second. And it's that if yesterday was 40 days until Rosh Hashanah, I guess that means, I mean, until Yom Kippur, I guess that means that today is 39 days until Yom Kippur. All right. See, this is what I'm usually doing when the other people are teaching. I'm setting it up, and this is literally how long it takes me to do it. Okay, guess what? That's over with. Welcome, 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 everybody. Thank you for coming to this class. I love doing this class. I look forward to it um, every month because we're building something. We started in Aries in Kodesh Nisan, and we went through this whole process. Now we're all the way to Kodesh Elul. Um, before we even begin to get there, and I'm going to share my um, my PowerPoint with you. If people brought their own shofar, they should get it out. Because 2020 as a year, 2020 you blow, okay? We are going to blow your BS away. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say something about 2020. So uh, originally when 2020, okay, even before 2020, since 5780, Tosh Shin Pei, I've been saying since the beginning, before it even happened last year, I'm like, ooh, Tosh Shin Pei. Pei is the mouth. The letter Pei is all about the mouth. Thinking that it would be the year that we would speak words that would manifest a new reality. But what happened? Instead, the pay ended up being the way that germs have been spread, that the coronavirus, because we did not speak with pay with the words of Kavod, the way that we should have in the beginning of this year, it turned into COVID and the pay of our mouth turned into pandemic. Okay, so for all those reasons and more, I have to say about this year, it really blows and we need to blow. So let us do that together. And um, I'm only going to be able to blow one long thing and I'm not gonna do the whole formal um, process of all the show for blows, but I just want you all to feel free to blow your own horn, so to speak. And we'll say the bracha, okay, together. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam Asher Kiddushanu B'Mitzvotah V'Tzivanu L'Shmoa Kol Shofar. Amen. All right. All right. Oh. Get down. Blow it away. Okay. Lorelei. That felt pretty good. I hope that everybody else can get 
I mean, I hope it wasn't too much for the volume. Right it, it's, it scared away the demons from my house in New Jersey. Great. It was very effective. I'm so glad. Yeah, yes. What are you doing in New Jersey? Clepo, be gone. Oh, Abigail, are you going to blow? Okay, wait. Turn yourself on. Uh, turn your 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 sound on so we can hear. She's like, okay. Well, uh, just because I'm also going to be using this audio recording for my podcast, I'm trying not to have too much downtime in the audio sound because sometimes when you're working with audio files, if there's total silence, they'll literally die. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so welcome everybody. Baruch Abba'im. Baruchim Abba'im. Ahuva, yay, you're here. Everybody's coming. Um, so where are we? We are in the second day of Rosh Chodesh Elul. It's the new month of Elul. I'm very excited to be teaching about this month because it's one of my favorite months. I know I say that about all the months. <laughs> but, you know, like children, you can have four favorite children like I do, and you can also have four, uh, 12 favorite months, although some of them are not my favorite months. But we won't be talking trash about some of those other months right now. We're gonna talk good stuff about Chodesh Elul, and I'm gonna put up on the screen my PowerPoint, okay, so that you can see what's going on. And normally what I do during these classes is like, I talk and talk, and then at the end I take questions and open it up. I basically, stay with that format just because I get distracted. And if we go down some kind of, um, some segue, I might not ever get back to where I was going, but if something is really urgent, you can turn your sound on and interrupt me and say, Lorelei, can I ask this really important question? But I won't be able to see you because I have the window minimized where all the little squares are so I can see what I'm looking at. So you need to understand that I don't see you if you're gesturing or whatever, okay? So that's the situation. We are in this series of 12 classes, Yesh Mazal Yisrael, Insights into Chodesh Elul, Elul and Virgo, the zodiac sign, Betula, the maiden, the young maiden, the virgin, M Mazal, Betula, okay? So as we know, this is one of a series of classes that I've been teaching. We are literally trying to go all around the zodiac and starting at the beginning in Chodesh Nisan, as I said before, we've already been through Aries, which was Nisan. We've been through Taurus, which was ER. We've been through Sivan, Gemini. Back in the day, we went through Tammuz, which was Cancer. Last month, we did Av, which was Leo, and now we're in Elul, which is Virgo, which is the sign that is ruled by Mercury. And guess what? We've met Mercury before. We met Mercury over in Gemini. So now what's happening in our, um, I'm going first to this page just to show you what we're talking about. So now what's happening in terms of the cycle of sacred time, which is our Jewish calendar and our Hebrew year, our Jewish year, the Hebrew calendar, and how it corresponds with the 12 tribes and the 12 zodiac signs. I hope that you can see my mouse moving around this circle. Can someone just tell me whether or not you can see my mouse on your screen that's moving around the circle to on the left side of your screen? Can someone unmute themselves and tell me if they can see yes. this? Yes. yes. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so pay attention to this mouse. Remember over here, Aries, so there's always things that are opposite, right? Aries is opposite Venus. Aries and Venus are opposite in, um, I'm sorry, Aries is Mars. Mars and Venus are opposite in Aries and Libra. Venus and Mars are opposite in Taurus and Scorpio. This is the seven planet classical system, which was the prevailing system and the industry standard until the planet Uranus was discovered, which threw everybody off because now we've gone from seven to eight, then there was more planets discovered, now we're at 10, um, which conveniently can overlay on the 10 sphere out instead of the seven, but when they start discovering more planets, we're gonna have a lot of problems with these overlay systems. So 
as I mentioned yesterday, I think in Tamima's class, it's best not to be overly attached to one system because conditions can change. And it's not good to try to make everything fit into everything else because then rigidity happens and then you're not open to new information. So anyway, back to what we're talking about, the opposites, right? So opposite Venus and Mars, then Venus and Mars, then Mercury and Jupiter. Remember Mercury, the ruler of Gemini, Jupiter, the ruler of Sagittarius. Then we had Moon and Saturn and Sun Saturn, because Moon and Sun, as you see on this diagram over here to the right of your screen, basically the Moon and Sun are the same planet in, in, in abstract thought. If you think about, moon, they're obviously different, but they're, they're the same, they're two sides of the same coin, the way that Mercury has two sides to it, the Gemini side and the Virgo side. Today we're here to learn about the Virgo side. So we have not yet come upon a zodiac sign that we've already talked about the planet until now, because we first talked about Mars, Venus, Mercury. We talked about the moon and sun. Now we're gonna talk about Mercury again, but we're gonna talk about it from the Virgo point of view instead of the Gemini point of view. What's the difference? Well, there is a difference. Mer Virgo is an earth sign and Gemini is an air sign. They're both mutable signs. Mutable means changeable, adaptable, transformative. But they work through these different elements. Um, the Mercury that works through Virgo works through the element of Earth. And Earth is about manifestation. Air is about thought. We receive the Torah during Chodesh Sivan, during Gemini, ruled by Mercury in Mutable air. Mutable is transformative air is thought. Transformative thought. What was more transformative thought than the Torah, right? But the Mercury of Virgo goes through the element of Earth. So it's mutable Earth. Mutable is transformative and Earth is manifestation. So it's what we're experiencing during the Mercury of Virgo is transformative manifestation and that is a completely wonderful way to look at the energy of Elul and how Elul can work for us to transform our manifestation through the acts of chuva and how do you do chuva through all sorts of mercurial ways so we're going to talk about that in one moment okay that was my preface to the preface now the formal preface for people who haven't been in this class before and again, I can't see the screen, so I don't know who's here. So I'm going to assume there's at least one person who's new, who I actually met earlier before the class began. And so welcome. Um, the whole premise behind this examination into Jewish astrology is the ambiguous weirdness that we experience between this and that, right? On one hand, you have people saying, Ein Mazali Israel. You, there is no such thing as astrology. Jews aren't supposed to pay attention to astrology. We don't believe in astrology. Okay, and this is based on a, in my opinion, misunderstanding of our sources that came about <clears throat> when we were disconnected from our um, mimetic communal norms after the Holocaust. Because the truth is, is that astrological motifs in art and artifacts household items, ritual objects, and in Jewish texts from antiquity until the eve of World War II itself. Don't just suggest, but there are actual evidence that astrology was a common component in the lives of Jewish communities. It was just there. It was just part of life. Was it something that people actively engaged in every day like they were studying Torah? No. It was just like astrology. It's just like a normal thing to think about to understand the cycle of sacred time in relation to the Jewish year, the Hebrew months, the tribes that were associated with the Hebrew months, and the mazalot of the months themselves, which, which everybody knows, which of course is a famo, famous Karlobachism. When I say everybody knows, you have to understand what I'm really saying is nobody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, that's, that's a Shlomoism. But when I say, it is known, Khaleesi, 
it literally means that everybody knows. Okay, so everybody knows that astrology was just a normal part of everyday life. Nothing, no big deal, but also not nothing. So why is it relegated to this like, uh, let's go on strike against a thing? That was a very big problem for me. When I moved to Israel in 2007 and went uh, orthodox overnight by putting on a long skirt and saying to myself, wow, well, I'm a, a vegetarian, so my, I must automatically be kosher. And in other words, I knew nothing whatsoever. And I dropped myself into a foreign culture and learned you know, the hard way from the ground up about the halakhic lifestyle. And I got a lot of kickback from Orthodox people about astrology, being a professional astrologer for many years. On one hand, they didn't, they told me it was, you know, a sore. On the other hand, they all came to me and wanted me to read their charts. So this is what started the whole thing. Um, here are some, I'm going to give you some beautiful examples of astrology and art and architecture, art and architecture and ephemeral items. There are many, many, many living examples that can be found, looked at, examined, and enjoyed every day, even today, of zodiac themed synagogue floors, walls, and ceilings, sacred items like Torah crowns, household items like calendars, ritual objects objects like swaddling bands that were made into communal Torah covers, all of these things have astrological motifs all over them. Um, I'm gonna come back to this slide in a minute, okay? So let's just agree that astrology was represented because I'm gonna show you lots of examples of that. Um, this is a picture of the Mazal Betula, Virg Virgo the Maiden, she is the ruler of Chodesh Elul that we're in. This is a picture from the Sefer Evernote, which was a uh, book of how to figure out when the, the months are going on. It was like a, a calendar fixer. It was a calendar and a way to calculate the calendar. And the, this was uh, an illustration from 1716. And you can really see it's sort of like Semi-colonial, you know, when you think of, well, pre-colonial, but it has that kind of look about it. Um, so why are these, why this picture of Virgo? Many, many times in Jewish art, you will see Virgo and Gemini, both of them, the Mercury signs, ruled by things that are double. Okay, so I'm not ruled by, represented like two flowers, two birds, these are two women. There, it's, uh, I think, a very clever way to represent Virgo as two, two women, because Virgo, deep in conversation, okay, because they're talking, and it's Mercury, it's Mercury is the planet, that's the planetary ruler of Virgo, so of course there's lots of talking going on with Virgos. Virgos may be very modest, but they're not silent, <laughs> and they also might be quiet, but they're not silent. Uh, this is a Torah crown uh, uh, with the, it says Mazal El there, which is interesting. And that's sort of interchangeable the way that they use, like they, it could say Mazal Batula because really literally that's what it is. Con Mazal is constellation, right? So it should say the name of the constellation, but it says the name of the month instead. Um, so this was from 1845. Um, here we see two flowers being held in the hands of, it says also Mazal Elul here, and then it says Betula underneath. This is from Poland in 1850. 1850. Um, and here is Virgo portrayed as a woman in a real Byzantine art kind of way, that kind of flat two-dimensional way. This is from the Beit Alpha Synagogue in Northern Israel and from the sixth century. So Virgo is is very interesting the way that Virgo is portrayed. So let's realize that we're sitting here as humans in the year 2020 of the common era, and we live in a society that is, um, the dominant culture is Christian. We are very, very aware of all the Christian um, motifs that we encounter every day living in, within this society. So we're all, we automatically go from Virgin to Virgin Mary, and there's a good reason for that. Okay, um, 
Mary, the Virgin Mary in the, in the Christian view of her was a, uh, was immediately, of course, she was assigned to Virgo, like the idea of Virgo and the Virgin Mary became one thing. It started off before Mary, way back in the day of the Greek mythology. This was about the goddess of agriculture. She's usually holding a sheaf of grain. You see over here in this Book of Hours from France, you see she's holding a sheaf of grain. Um, that is normally what she you, she, you see her holding a sheaf of grain. Sometimes she hold, holds a torch, which over here is um, portrayed in a Jewish, obviously because it's a synagogue floor, in Jewish art. This is the fourth century and, and the Virgin is holding the torch over there. Um, and over here, this early 15th century uh, picture of Virgo, she's holding a flower, but it's on a stalk. There's always something kind of long going on, okay? We'll get there as to why I think that is happening. Um, here we have a Torah crown. She's seated. She's holding a stalk of wheat. It's very big, okay? That's from 1859. Here's another Torah crown. She's, oh wait, is that the same as before? She's holding a flower with a sheaf behind her, okay? So here I find something super interesting, the Virgin and the unicorn in Jewish art, okay? What the hell, people? Why is a unicorn showing up on a Torah binder in Germany from 1722? Why is the Virgin and the unicorn embroidered or painted onto a ketubah, a Jewish marriage contract from the early 18th century in Venice? That seems very odd, doesn't it? Do we believe in unicorns? Is unicorns a Jewish thing? Okay. So back in the days of mythology, the Christian idea of Virgo, because Virgin Mary, became a symbol of virginity and sexual chastity, which it was not a symbol of in pagan cultures or in the pre-Christian era. Okay. So the transformation of Virgo's identity is expressed in the folk tale of the unicorn. Everybody knows, and it is known, Khaleesi, that the only way to catch a unicorn is to get a virgin to go sit alone in the forest. When the unicorn sees her, he's going to jump into her lap, and so it is captured. So I've been thinking about this for so long. It just is really blown my mind, and then I realized, what other horn do we blow during Kodesh Elul, okay? Is the unicorn's horn a code for the shofar embedded in these Jewish representations of the month of Elul, rather than evidence of Christian iconography, which made its way into Jewish arts? Because I'll bet you a million dollars that you could Google right now about unicorns in Jewish art and get a lot of scholars telling you about how the dominant culture, um, you know, symbols and archetypes like drifted down into us and we adopted them and changed them. But I'm gonna say, and I dare anybody to <laughs> argue with me, that Chodesh Elul, it is known that we blow a horn during Chodesh Elul. Maybe you can't get a ram's horn if you're living in the middle of Germany in 1722 or Venice, but maybe, you can hope for a unicorn's horn. How are you going to get a unicorn? I mean, it's a it's an unbelievable thing to me that this is this is part of our art history. So I thought that was a I thought that was very insightful also into the quality of Virgo because Virgo as a person, the vir the virgin, the young lady has to sit quietly and wait for the unicorn to jump into her lap. That is a, Virgo is very patient. Virgo is, Virgo rules the sixth house, which has to do with service, service to others. So um, it would be a Virgo who would sit in, <laughs> sit in the forest and wait for a unicorn to jump into her, uh, into her lap. But I'm also going to say there's a, a symbolic flip side to this too, because if you look at like let's say this figure over here on the left, it's okay, she's almost always sitting. When she's holding something on her lap, 
she's always sitting and this very long thing extends. I think it's like a, it's like a phallic symbol in a sense. Okay, I'm gonna go, I am gonna go there and say that. So, so there. Um, this is a picture of Virgo the Maiden from a medical text that was written in Hebrew in Southern Germany at the end of the 15th century, discussing um, days during the month of Elul not to do bloodletting. Um, Virgo, as I said before, is associated with the sixth house in astrology. That's the house of the mind-body connection, health and healing and the healing arts. And everybody who knows anyone who's a Virgo probably knows that Virgos are very health oriented in one way or the other. They like to be healthy. They don't like to be unhealthy and or they worry about their health all the time. There's always something going on in the area of health with our Virgo peeps. So Elul and Virgo correspond to the abdomen, intestines, gallbladder, pancreas, liver, and digestive system of the cosmic body. And again, this is a favorite picture of ours. This is the Zodiac man. He's a Jewish Zodiac man. We know that because we see his Brit Milah in his Scorpio place. We'll get there eventually. Um, so the idea it has been in medicine, this was a, a very common way to understand how to heal people was to understand the, co the correlations between body parts and Zodiac signs so that those body parts could be dealt with on a medical level. And really this was something that was extremely common throughout um, medieval times. And who knows, it could be making a, com a comeback, you don't know. The Zodiac man in this Hebrew calendar over here from 1788 and 89 represents Virgo as a young woman seated holding a sheaf of wheat. Wait, where is that? Oh, okay, I wrote the wrong thing. This might not be from 1789 because she's not seated. But anyway, Virgo, oh yeah, it is. I'm sorry, I was looking at the man, <laughs> not, not the Virgo sign. Okay, so I'm circling with my mouse over here around Virgo. You see, she's sitting like as before, she's holding a sheaf of wheat and the line that extends from her to the body part she's, is the digestive tract. And here is a detail from an 18th century German amulet. We have Elul depicted as a winged woman, which might have an allusion to Mercury, winged Mercury, winged Mercury, right? Holding a flower branch, a long flower branch. I notice also with all of the flowers that are depicted, these are not like short stumpy flowers. The flower branches are always elongated, so. That maybe echoes like the torch, the flowers, the sheaf of wheat, the elongated uh, branch, and the unicorn horn. Elul is symbolized by the combination of the letters that form the divine name associated with this month. We are in the month of Hey Hey, Yud Vav. Remember, we started over here in, um, in Chodesh Nisan with what we would call the regular normal procession of the letters. And so there's 12 different ways to combine these letters. Each one of them corresponds with one of the months of the year. So we're in Hey Hey Yud Vav during Chodesh Elul. Elul, as I said before, is the virgin. She's the maiden. Elul is ruled by the letter Yud, which is the first letter of the divine name. It's alluding to wisdom. The ruling planet, again, Mercury, Kohav, Kohav just means star. Mercury was so close to us in our imagination that we just called it star. Yeah, the star. We gave all the other stars names. So you can say Kohavim means stars, but Kohav is Mercury. It's like our star. The Sefer Yetzirah tells us that the ruling attribute of Kodesh Elul is action. And the element is earth, of course, Virgo is the mutable earth sign, as I said before. The tribe is Gad, which means either and both, a troop or good fortune. Um, according to the Sefer Yetzirah, the left hand or arm is the body part. And we all know that Elul is the month of Teshuva, returning, taking action to return to the proper path. Because again, ruling attribute is action, we're using that action to return to the proper path 
and it's through the mutable earth, the transformative manifestation of the mer of the thought and the uh, perception of this mercurial month that we're able to do that. Um, yeah. Okay, Gad, the tribal ruler of Virgo and Elul. So Rashi tells us that Gad means good fortune or good luck. In Hebrew, the word Bagad is comprised of two words, Ba has come and Gad, good fortune. Someone, people who are um, chatting up there, I see a little floating screen, but I can't see what you're writing. So I hope you're not talking to me, um, but I'll look at it later. Um, Rashi says, and I don't know why it was written as one word. So this was from uh, the Torah when Leah said, good luck has come and she named him Gad. So this is what it says in Hebrew, but um, Begad, right? So that's, that's how it was written and Rashi is wondering why and he doesn't really know why, okay? So Ibn Ezra says that Gad means a troop as in, I don't even know really, Gidud, Gidud, okay? And this is what Leah meant when she said, but God for her sons now made up a whole troop. So the flag of Gad, this is not actually a picture. Of, it's a picture that someone drew of what they thought the flag looked like. His flat, Rashi tells us his flag was neither white nor black, but a blend of black and white on it was embroidered a camp in allusion to the text, Gad, a troop shall troop upon him. Here's a, I like this drawing. It was made by some kids. Okay, so you see a camp. So before it was soldiers, but what it means is a troop, a troop of soldiers that live in a camp. Okay, so more about this tribe, interesting. Gad was born circumcised, says Rashi, okay? And he was destined because of this great merit to become the most perfect of all the 12 sons. But his descendants, the ones that came in with the generation that uh, conquered the, the land with um, Joshua, chose to settle in what's called the Transjordan area, okay, Ever Yarden. And through this choice, they basically forfeited the holiness of living in Eretz Yisrael proper. That's in this map over here. Okay, so you all remember the story that um, some of the tribes were like, no, we want to stay on this side of the Jordan because it looks great. We have a lot of cattle. So he was one of those tribes. All right. Um, Rabbi Monk in his Zohar, which I'm assuming is a commentary on the Zohar, writes that the great loss for the tribe of Gad is represented by the single Hebrew word, the Gad, which is missing the letter Aleph, symbolizing the fact that part of their good fortune was missing. That's a little sad, okay? What else do we know about him? Um, Eliyahu, Eliyahu Hanavi hails from the tribe of Gad, okay? Gad was a natural warrior. One of the, one of the brothers that um, Yosef hid from Pharaoh was Gad because he didn't want him to be constrict, um, conscripted into Pharaoh's army because he was a big, strong guy. Okay, uh, so Jacob blessed his son, Gad, a troop shall tramp upon him, but he shall triumph at last. So that is a interesting insight into the Gad energy, right? That there's another thing about Virgos that people need to understand is that they are going to win in the end in some way or another. They're going to keep going, not in terms of like, they might get tired and give up, but they're never going to stop trying to analyze something until they have figured it out. And that to them is their big triumph. Um, as I said before, the Hebrew for Mercury is Kohav, which just means star. It's the closest to us at the earth. They, um, the ancients, of course, were very close to Mercury and kept their eyes on it all the time. They imagined him as um, Mercury, the messenger of the gods. I don't really love this picture of him. Um, but you see that he's wearing wings on his hat and wings on his, his ankles. This is the idea between, behind Mercury is that he's always on the move. This is the Mercury archetype, communicative, curious, inquisitive, quick, 
these are this is this is true for both Virgo and um, Gemini. They just manifest differently. They're restless. They're restless people. They're multifaceted people. They're versatile, clever, charming, carefree, happy, entertaining, distracting, and they love variety and everything information oriented, striving for knowledge and diversity. Uh, Mercury's, we've talked about this last time we talked about Mercury, but um, this still goes for the truth for the two Mercury signs, Gemini and Mercury. Mercury's association with travel and communication is described in the Talmudic passage in Shabbat 156a, which we read a few weeks ago. And I was excited as could be to finally get there, having slogged through <laughs> Daf Yomi on my way to finishing the entire Talmud uh, in seven point something years, just so I can collect all the astrological material therein. So finally I hit the mother load there and I was excited about it. This is uh, part of what I call the planetary hours passage. It's rabbis um, arguing about which is more influential, the, sun, the planet that rules the day you're born or the hour that you were born. And by hour, they're talking about the ascendant or the rising sign. Okay, so what do they say about Mercury? He who was born under Mercury will be of a retentive memory and wise. What is the reason? Because Mercury is a sun scribe. You know, Mercury is walking, is running along after the sun, writing everything down that Mercury is doing. This is a picture of Mercury being the sun scribe. Um, according to the Jewish understanding of the planetary days, Thursday, the fifth day, belongs to the planet Mercury which of course, again, holds Gemini and Virgo. <clears throat> Gemini and Virgo are the two fully human signs. Gemini is the twins and Virgo is the young woman or maiden. Gemini and Virgo both are social signs. They are associated with the thought process, communication and great people skills. Uh, he who is born under Mercury will be of a retentive memory and wise. Why? Again, because he's the sun scribes. He's writing everything down and taking notes. Okay, Gemini does it so he can ac accumulate data and information, and Virgo does it so she can analyze. This is the glyph, which is a symbol associated with Virgo. It's kind of like an M shape that's curled on itself. The M represents the intestines uh, and virginity or sexual modesty, as opposed to a glyph for Scorpio, which is also an M, but it has a curved tail and an arrow at the end, which we'll see in a couple of months. So the curled loop also demonstrates Virgo's ability to discern between right and wrong, virtuousness and immorality. Um, the Sefer Yetzirah links the constellation Virgo to the left kidney and the letter Yud and links the planet Mercury, ruling planet of both Virgo and Gemini, to the right ear and the letter Resh. Ptolemy, who is not Jewish but was the industry standard of understanding astrology up, up until Copernicus, links Mercury to speech, thought, the tongue, bile, and the buttocks. Okay? So the archetype is one who harvests and critically examines everything for its usefulness and suitability. And Virgo corresponds to the harvest in which the chaff is separated from the weak, wheat. Virgo separates that which is useful from that which does not serve a purpose by means of their critical skills and analytic powers. And the function of Virgo is I analyze. Now, is, don't you think that this is a perfect zodiac sign archetype for the month of Elul, the month of Teshuvah, the month that we are supposed to wake up from the sound of the shofar and critically examine our own souls. This is Heshbon HaNefesh. This is our opportunity during the month of Elul to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, okay, and to examine, critically examine our own lives. I also want to bring up this little ditty, which is that Mercury, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the connection between Sivan and Elul being King David, okay? So this is, Sivan and Elul are both symbolized by human forms, and both are connected to Teshuvah and returning to God. 
Sivan is the month of Matan Torah, receiving the Torah of Mount Sinai. El is the month of Teshuva, when the king is in the field. Shavuot is the barley harvest. El is the wheat harvest. David HaMelech was the most famous Gemini, and he was born and died on Shavuot. And during El, what do we say? We say the king is in the field. Who is the king? David Melech Israel, Chai Chai Vikayam. It's David HaMelech in archetype, right? The king is a messianic allusion to Mashiach ben David. So I thought that was an interesting little connection between Sivan and Elul. That's the Mercury Mercury connection. Um, Virgo is motivated by the joy that they derive from details. They love to critically examine everything for suitability. They strive for purity and health. They are very triggered by chaos. They can become obsessive. Um, some of the pitfalls they experience are perfectionism. They can be overly cautious and fussy about things. If you see that Mercury and Virgo are opposite Jupiter and Pisces in the classical seven planet zodiac system, you understand that Mercury and Jupiter are the rulers of all of the mutable signs. Okay, so notable events of Chodesh Elul over the years. Okay, we know that Rosh Chodesh Elul always has two days. The days of Elul are called Yemi Ratzon, the days of favor or desire. You know, we talk about, we talk about um, the king is in the field. That's such an intimate, intimate opportunity to be close to God, right? That's the, the days of favor or desire because the king is in the field. It's before the king is high and lifted up, before um, royalty. I mean, I'm sorry for saying king, but I'm going to just say king. You can substitute whatever word you like. Um, it's a it's an archetype of that period of time where everything is very imminent. The Shekhinah is very imminent to us. God's in God's imminent presence is the closest, so that we can not be afraid. Because think of how scary it is to meet the King when the King is high and lifted up on the throne. It's so scary that when it happened to Isaiah, he fell on his face and wanted to die basically. I mean, it is too much sometimes, but if you, if you meet the king in the field, if you meet the king in disguise, you know, do you remember that old story, the prince and the pauper, where the prince and the pauper changed their clothes so the prince could go out into this world without being, oh my god, it's the prince, it's the prince, and he could go and do whatever he wanted. So it's like that, the king puts on clothes, and clothes of humility and comes to us so that we can be together. Um, Chodesh El has some interesting things that happen in it. The second tablets are given to Moses on Rosh Chodesh El, and Moses goes up to Mount Sinai again for the third time for this third 40-day period. That's why we know it's 40 days until Yom Kippur and um, other things that happened. I want to make sure that we're leaving enough time at the end here for, um, for questions, so I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. Uh, a lot of stuff happened in L. I'm going to have this available for you guys to download afterwards if you want. Also, so the, the, I want to get to the days of creation. So there's a thing that happens in L, starting from the 18th of L. It's called Tikkun HaChodeshim. So how does it work? Every day between the 18th of L and Erev Rosh Hashanah corresponds to a particular month of the past year. So the process, the Kabbalistic process of Tikkun HaChodeshim allows us to meditate on those months one day at a time, starting on the 18th of Elul and working our way down day by day and fix what we can about those months. So looking back on the months of this past year, each one of those days is going to correspond to one of the months. And it's an opportunity for us to examine. It's just another tool. It's like Spirit Omer, having a Spirit Omer counter. There's always an opportunity, you know, no matter how you want to slice it, to examine ourselves and take things apart in this kind of methodical way. But I really love 
Tikkun HaChodeshim, and I've been doing it on Facebook for years and years, like I have a whole Facebook group about it. I don't know if I'm even going to have time to do it this year, but I've enjoyed meeting and being led by and taught by other people and experiencing other people's um, experience of this. So maybe I'll try to do it again. Excuse but, me, Lorelai. Yes. Can we see that up close. I'm sorry, what? Can we see that up closer? I don't know. Can't, I, I, I don't, uh, you mean this picture? Yeah. Does that help? A little bit, but I would love to really be able to see each picture really close. But okay, well, on my screen, it's at 100%, and then if I can't really make it smaller than that, I mean, bigger than that, then I won't be able to see. But this, I will make this available for people to, um, obviously, it's being recorded, and it'll be on the Facebook page, but um, you, you could get a copy of it, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Hold on. Just want to be able to see what I'm doing. Okay. Yes, the cycle of sacred time. Wait, here's an important question. Why does my horoscope say I'm a Virgo when I was born during Chodesh Av or during, oh, this shouldn't say Elo, it should say Tishrei. Okay. So that's because when you overlay the Hebrew calendar on top of the solar calendar, you find out that there's actually 36, not 12, permutations of the zodiac. So the date that Chodesh Elul starts is going to vary um, within the 19-year metonic cycle that makes up our Jewish calendar. So a person might be an Av Virgo. That would be someone who was born after August 22nd while it's still Chodesh Av. Like, let's say somebody is born uh, it's LO, right? It's already LO, but um, so this wouldn't be something like this year, but it's happened in other years. An LO Virgo is someone who's born between August 22nd and Rosh Hashanah what, when it's Chodesh LO. And then a Tishrei Virgo is someone who's born when Rosh Hashanah falls before September 23rd. So you have to really look at the whole thing over a series of 19 years to see how this works out. I'm not going to put your, you through that kind of hell, but you can trust me because I've already done it, <laughs> okay? Um, everybody has all 12 of the zodiac signs in their own personal natal chart, okay? You might not be a sun sign Virgo, but you have Virgo somewhere in your house. So it, um, it, Virgo is the ruler of one of your 12 houses, and that's the area of your life where that Gad, that tribe of Gad energy is manifested okay it's that personal purity um why is this not working? okay here is a, an example of the natal chart of the united states because we've been doing that we've been going through um examples of what this looks like when i say everybody's got every sign right so you see just looking at this round circle over here on the left on the inside of the circle, those symbols are the planets and where they were when the United States was born on 1776. That's the natal, natal chart of the United States. So Virgo, it's a little tricky now because this is a picture of the whole house system. I usually use a Placidus house system, but for illustrative purposes, it's actually more handy to use it this way. It's Virgo is the ruler of the 10th house of the United States, but the midheaven, the actual technical top of the chart is at one degree of Virgo. So that puts the midheaven of the United States in her 11th house in the whole house system, the whole sign system. So her public image, that's the 10th house, is really centers on her friends, groups, affinity groups, and the collective, the community. This is a, as if the United States was a person. We're talking about her personality, so to speak. So the 10th house is the business and career, public image. The America's 10th house is ruled by Mercury. So we're fast, we're forward, we're all over the place, we're running to and fro, we're making ourselves known on every corner of the globe, we're spreading knowledge. But our midheaven is in Libra, the scales of justice. So we're a land ruled by law, we're everyone, the whole group, the claw, the community. That's the 11th house. 
is, un, is equal, quote unquote, under the law. Ruled by Venus, the planet of wealth. We're a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy country. Okay, so America's public image, that's the 10th house, is very busy and influential, that's Mercury. Um, and the only planet in, Mer in Virgo in the United States is Neptune. Neptune, of course, was not discovered at the time that um, America was born. Neptune wasn't discovered until much later. So America didn't know it had the planet Neptune in its chart, but it is there. Um, Neptune in this, in, in every chart symbolizes idealization, what you idealize, okay? It also is a planet of what we're gonna call glamor, as in, oh, that person is so glamorous. What it makes them glamorous? They put on a shit ton of makeup. Uh, that is the idea that there's something illusionary about glamor, okay? <clears throat> so, excuse me. Neptune <clears throat> rules illusion, beautiful illusions, also delusions, dangerous delusions in some cases. <clears throat> so how does this work? Neptune in the 10th house in Virgo, <clears throat> it, we look Virgo from the outside, pure and simple, but on the inside, it's way more complicated than that. Okay, this Chodesh Elul, I'm not even going to go through this whole thing because too many things. I'm just going to say the big, big things that are happening during this year, this Chodesh Elul coming up right now <coughs> is, okay, August 24th, that's in a few days from now, Mars and Aries is going to square Saturn and Capricorn. It's going to be a shit show. I'm just telling you in advance. It's a very, very hard square of Mars and Saturn. No one's going to want to be around it. Um, and let's just hope it doesn't play itself out in some like ultra um, violent way. God forbid, and low Elena. Um, let me see what else is like the most crazy things. Oh, this is what is the other big thing on the 9th of September, Mars goes retrograde. Mars is going to be retrograde for a while. Mars is the ruling planet of, in classical astrology, Scorpio, but it's also the ruling planet of Aries. Um, and this Mars retrograde couldn't come at a more inconvenient time for everybody, okay? Because it lasts from the 9th of, of uh, September up until the 13th of November. So it's going to be retrograde all for the election and um, I'm going to have a lot to say about this, but not right now. Okay. And I would like to say thank you to all my many teachers in this world and the world to come and the world behind me too. Mattis Yahoo Glazer sent above the Zodiac Astrology and a Jewish Light, which I always use for really great references. And a lot of this art came from Written in the Stars, Art and Symbolism in the Zodiac by Irish, Iris Bischoff. And I take a lot of my beautiful graphics from this wonderful resource that anybody could go to, click on it, and you can search by iconographical subject and find out a lot about wonderful stuff in Jewish art. Oh my God, it's 1257. I am, this happens to me every time. I like, I can't talk anymore. Now I need you to talk. Tyler, please, <laughs> I want to call on you. Can I call on you? This is my my wonderful Tyler. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So I um a little hero project at page called Devar Tarot. Uh, we have a lot of fun. We do um and by we I mean I. I do uh weekly Shabbat readings. I will be doing daily readings for Kodesh Elul. And um to get us in that cheshmon hanefesh, accounting for the soul kind of spirit. Um, and I will use the cards to give us a little kavana, a little intention for the month of Elul ahead. Yay.
Hello. Can you show the last page again with the reference to uh, uh, the archive? I'll do that later. Okay. Well, I like to concentrate on what um, is coming down right now. So Tyler is, is drawing a card. I'm going to make you a spotlight so people can see you. Okay, let's see. Spotlight video. All right, go ahead. So this is the King of Pentacles. This is, um, I mean, this could be David Havela. Like, it's, um, it's very much uh, a wealthy kind of king. It's very much okay. uh, a strong, I mean, it could also be the sovereign is in the field. I, I see that. And so, um, what Rabbi Arthur Wasco teaches is that it's like the sovereign is wearing jeans. There's <laughs> the very earthy, very down to earth feeling of, um, of the sovereign wearing jeans. So, Luigi, stop. Oops. Our next card is um, the mother in this deck or the queen of wands. And so the Queen of Wands. Um, Whoa. King of, wait, King of Pentacles and Queen of Wands, you just, you just, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, so now we have this interplay between uh, Earth and fire. Wands um, evoke all of the fire signs. Mm. So Wands can move through Aries and Leo and Sagittarius and so we have still this summer heat thrill and still this passion and this like super important communication and Shefa and Yetzer and all this all these different vital energies swirling around there's so much going on right now and our last card Oh, our Ooh. last time the Empress. So the Empress is very wow. much the mother archetype. This is if Virgo is maiden, Empress is mother. You have so much here that is ruled by Venus, and you have so much here that is you know, what's coming to mind for me is um, our rabbis love an acronym, they right? Do. So Elul, the acronym is Ani Ladodi Ivadodi Li. I am my beloved and my, my beloved is mine. And <laughs> so in, in our modern sense, like maybe we don't want to get possessive over our partners like that, but if we think of it in our relationship to the Shekinah, the divine direct presence of God, which is feminine, um, again, we have um, Hamelech or Hamaka is, is in the field. This is, there is so much at stake this month. And so the advice for you this month is to um, to roll up your sleeves, to be the scribe to the king in the way that Mercury is to the sun. To get out your notepad, take notes. <laughs> this is, there is so much going on that if you don't take notes, you're gonna miss it. Right. Wow, thank you. That's so beautiful. And it's, you know, the new moon of Chodesh Elul happened to be the moon in Leo, right? Because we're now on that part, part of the cycle. It's 28 degrees of Leo. It's almost Virgo. But um, so that Leo fire <clears throat> sun energy is definitely, um, you know, coming down into this month. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for for doing those cards. Yeah, thank you.
so special to have you here. So now I will take questions from the field, from the kings and queens in the field. Question. Yes, you have a question, yes. I do, I'm sorry I had to jump out because my veterinarian called me. But um, my question is, I was reading this week's Parsha and this week's Parsha gets into all that whole scuff about, you know, no mach shefa, no this and no that, no the other. And is there a two minute answer to how astrology gets around that? Yeah, because I, well, there is a two minute answer to it. <clears throat> so do you want to say more about that, specifically what it says? Uh, do you have that handy or not? I don't have it. I don't have it right in front of me, but um, right. so, but I know it gets into no divining, no soothsaying, yeah. no witchcraft. Well, astrology, no. Right. Uh, so 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 there's astrology, and then there's divination, witchcraft, soothsaying. They're not the same thing. A and B. You know, I was joking a little bit with Jonathan before the class started about you know <clears throat> we take things. We, by, Jew, by the Jewish tradition, is our, our, our way of dealing with things that are a sore to us or forbidden to us is to bring them into our culture and put it through our own little laundromat of the Beit Midrash. And then we've turned, right. it, we've turned it into a subject for study or something that we have to know about. We know from the Talmud that the rabbis were astrologers, that they taught magic. They, that astrology, we know that astrology as a subject was taught in the Beit Midrashes of the medieval Ashkenaz, which you can't get firmer than that. Right, no, 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 I, 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 I know this because I brought it to Kol Shofar and I had so much flack, but I just ran into it last night and I said, well, I'm watching today's Lorelei thing, so maybe I'll ask her how did Judaism get away? They just shifted it and made it work for us, basically, our own yeah, way. Or that, uh, the, the, it's just like everything else, like... Yeah, okay. the Jew, like being the whole thing about the Torah and we should have no other God before me. And right. Our God is number one and there is nothing else was a huge, huge, huge cultural shift from entire prehistory right. of life where everybody saw gods and goddesses in the right. stars everything. and everything. And they had a pantheistic understanding of creation and the creator. <laughs> So this was what we, that was our uniqueness in the right. monotheism. So to be monotheistic, you got to kill all the other gods. You can have no rivals. So you have to put down everything that threatens you in any way possible. What's the number one threat? Okay, what did people do the minute they could open their eyes and became people and the sun went down? They looked at the stars. <clears throat> the stars, the, the, the celestial creation is the most powerful evidence of divinity that there is to a mind that has no consciousness of monotheism or any of the other theisms. That is just a, a mind that knows itself as a self. Was it mostly a male thing in Judaism? So maybe they were talking in Torah about getting rid of what women might have been doing. And then this is what males created? I, I think that everybody, I don't think that it was male or female because when you look at okay. the archetypes of astrology and how the whole thing works, I don't think it was like a thing of where, well, the women knew all about the stars so the men had to get rid of them. I don't really see it like that at no, all. No, 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 I'm, I'm thinking so, or maybe the women were doing bones or whatever as divination and so they knock that, I don't know. Well, anything right. that women do, they automatically did not want. Right, to right. Do. But men were, the, were saucers, male saucers and, and magicians are portrayed a lot in the Talmud as are witches. I mean, it was, it was, a, it yeah. was a egalitarian. Um, yeah. yeah, can I say, gender. yeah, I want, to sec I want to second that and say it's not gender based. Everybody did everything but we have less written evidence of women astrological tracks because they weren't published because the men didn't let them publish it. And Ibn Ezra and all the other great astrologers had mothers and sisters that knew this stuff and it was repressed. We're, we're finding more evidence that the women taught this as well. Divination, astrology, and the, and the healing practices. Were there gender differentiations in this? That's a really good question. No one solved that yet. It's a really good question, but I think everybody did everything, frankly. Thank There's you. A lot of stuff going on, and also in the in the areas of healing, health, women's health, 
midwifery. I mean, you know, there's the, a, a, anywhere, any way you go down any of those roads, there were male and female healers, but if you think about a society of what we call like women's, women's uh, medicine. Totally. Something very right. Totally. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's always going to be that rivalry. And then there's just the classic human rivalry that men can't make another human being come out of their body. So there's that that goes back to the very primal kind of fear, awe, and we have to get control of this because that's a magic we can't do. They have the magic. We don't have that magic. What are we going to do about it? You know, so that's, yeah. that's not our problem anymore. Thank you. <laughs> because all kind of people can have all sorts of babies in all sorts of ways that have been overcome by mere biological impediments at our ancestors face. So we don't really have to worry about that so much anymore. Um, Mark, do you want to ask a question? Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm thinking about, so you're showing the pictures of Virgo mm -hmm. and how she's often holding sheaves of like weed or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that reminded me of medieval imagery and how that's a common image of women, how they have the pile of wheat or sheaves of something agriculture and commonly that's associated with the image of like spinning and weaving mm -hmm. and um those associations maybe the fates and i'm wondering if there's this same association with virgo spinning or weaving interesting i don't know that i've seen any kind of um graphic uh represent presentation of Virgo in terms of spinning and weaving, but interestingly in, you know, Virgo's, Virgo's function is to sift, is to mm. separate, is to like separating the wheat from the chaff. It's to examine, critically examine things and uh -huh. separate things from each other for this is for this, this is for that. Categorizing, this is useful, this is not useful, blah, 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 blah. How does that relate to spinning though, in the sense that spinning is bringing all these different schemes together, right? It's bringing things together, but there's also that idea that there are multiple, multiple things being worked with. So you could play with it in that way. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's so interesting that all the women, she's always sitting down, ex except in one or two pictures that I've seen, Virgo is always sitting down, whether she's holding a, a flowers or she's sitting waiting for a unicorn to jump into her, into her lap. I would like to see that. I wish there was a forest nearby. I would go find a Virgo and make them go do that. A Virgo virgin, that's what I would find just to make sure that it could happen. Um, yeah, so um, yes, go ahead, ask. Um, I grew up with a father and a sister and I'm a Virgo and I think one of the Stereotypes of Virgo, Virgos is around neatness. And my take on that is any Virgo I've ever met, and about 70% of my life is Virgos, is um, there's a relationship with order. It can be rebellious, it can be disorder, um, but it's, it's often um, in that fussy, discriminating way, there's a sense of looking for inner harmony. Right. So for me, the weaving with the weft and the um, whatever the other word is. Um, the wolf. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Um, there's a synthesis and there's a braiding together. There's a weaving together out of all this disparate, you make a cloth. That's very so, Virgo-y, isn't it? Yeah, I know. And it's, it, to me, it's also um, typically more craft than art. If you mm -hmm. think of craft being within uh, um, form and the way we experience art is often breaking form, but it's a balance with art and craft and design. You know, Virgos are, it's, are hilarious because, you know, the, every sign has its stereotype. Virgos are neat nicks, okay? I know a lot of Virgos. My best friend, Amy Wachtel, who's not here today, but I'm sure she's going to listen to this later, is yeah. a Virgo, and she will be the first to tell you. Like, her, 
So I'm not going to talk about her apartment in Greenwich Village that's filled to the brim with every single artifact from Massey Boratius, but I will tell you that it gives her a lot of stress because she needs to order it, okay? Like the ordering of things and organizing things and archiving things and putting things in the right way. It might look messy to the outside, messy, whatever that means, but inside the Virgo needs to know like where everything is. They need to break it down. They need, they, they need to be very exact and specific about things. Um, that makes them feel better. They don't do well with chaos. Like, in, and their opposite is Pisces, which thrives in chaos. It's like, I'm a Pisces, just throw me in the middle of, a, of the whole thing. I'm gonna just melt. Virgo opposites, like, no, don't give, don't, because I have to order this. I have to order it, I have to analyze it, I have to figure it out, I have to know where to put all of these things. So yeah. uh, Virgos have a lot of anxiety around, can have a lot of anxiety around orderliness and neatness, perfectionism, having to do things the right way, being really fussy and picky about different things, but just depending on how, like all of the other factors, what kind of family were you raised in? How were you treated as a child? Did your parents force you to eat everything on the plate or did they let you say, I don't like that, <laughs> you know? It mm -hmm. all really just depends. So it's envir environmental factors have a lot to do with how that Virgo part of a person will, will manifest, but um, it always does come out in one way or the other. I have twin grandsons who are Virgos, who are like, <laughs> they notice everything. Virgos are very, very um, astute observers because they're constantly analyzing things. So they're always coming up with like the most hilarious observations about their Sagittarius Softa, which is me. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, I cleaned my bathroom this morning because I'm going to pick them up immediately after this because I know they're going to notice and will say something even if they don't think that things are the way that they should be or if things are out of order or if they come to my house and they, I've moved one thing from one place to another, they're going to want to know why and then they'll listen to my explanation and they will evaluate it and analyze it as Virgos do, and then they'll decide if that's okay or not. So that's mm -hmm. a, another way that Virgos work. Um, so it's about 1.15. Does anybody have anything else that they want to ask? Um, I'm so happy that everybody who came today, oh, Amy, you are here. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, Amy did, were you here when I was talking about you as a Virgo and your and your apartment? Can you hear me? <laughs> she's like, no, but I'm. She's like, yes, okay. You'll get. I'll get back to you later. <laughs> Let's hope my friend isn't mad at me for talking about her as an example of Virgo orderliness or anxiety over having to categorize too much things together. Um, and I just want to bless everybody to have a, a wonderful Hodesh Elul, and may we really encounter uh, the sovereign in the field, whether that's the king, the queen, the empress. Um, Tyler, I have to say thank you so much for that beautiful tarot reading. Devar tar Tarot. I want to say Devar Tarot. No, that doesn't work. If you guys look for her on Facebook, she's there. I'm going to write it there. Var Tarot. Um, what else do I want to say? I'm going to turn off this broadcast and stop.